All right. Uh, let's uh, turn to 1 Peter 3, verse 13. Notes you should have picked up. <clears throat> 1 Peter 3, 13. And you can need to rebound, do so. 1 Peter 3.13, page 24 of your notes. <clears throat> Dealing with undeserved suffering. That's the topic of verses 13 through 17. All people are going to suffer. They live any amount of time on this earth. So you might as well figure out how to make, turn this into something very positive for you. <clears throat> anyway, dealing with undeserved suffering. Our vital interests are sacrosanct. That's misspelled, so what? And who is there to harm you? A rhetorical question. And who is there to harm you? This is a future participle, looking ahead down the road. Uh, uh, this is to treat badly. Harm can even be translated, be cruel. Anyway, if you prove zealous for what is good, if you prove, maybe you will, maybe you won't. If you prove, prove is genomai, as I said, it's an aorist uh, middle or deponent subjunctive, whatever. Uh, zealous. The word zealous is zelotes, one who is jealous, uh, zealous, uh, as, as in those verses. Uh, for what? Definite article. For the good, literally. They, have, they put in the word what for obvious reasons. For the good, agathos, the divine good, the intrinsic good. Uh, persecution is a road to blessing. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, this is, this is what we call undeserved suffering. You didn't bring it on yourself, as in deserved suffering, which we have under the general doctrine of divine discipline. But we're talking about undeserved suffering for the faith, for being a believer and standing in the, in, the, in the truth. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, but even if uh, the present active optative of POSCO, to suffer, equals a fourth class condition, is used to indicate a possible condition in the future, usually a, re a remote possibility, such as if perhaps this should occur. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, dikaiosune, blessed, <clears throat> the adjective makarios, <clears throat> means blessed, fortunate, or happy, found 49 times in the New Testament. And then he inserts a citation from the Old Testament, which says, and do not fear their, their intimidation. <clears throat> uh, do not fear, phobeo, eris, passive. This is a hortatory subjunctive. And do not fear their intimidation. Intimidation is fear. Do not fear their fear, uh, their intimidation in this case, phobos. There, and do not be troubled. And again, eris passive subjunctive, tarasso. Tarasso means to be in trouble or to be, on the other hand, to be in the passive, it means to be agitated, stirred up. It's used of stirring up water, for instance. Point one, <clears throat> Peter now brings this scripture quotation of verses 10 through 12 directly to bear on the situation of the readers. To at this point, we move into the main section of the letter, which continues right up to the farewell greetings. The trials and dangers of these believers in these churches move into center stage. To encourage these believers, 
the writer develops a series of interwoven strands of thought. The idea that a righteous person can face suffering with confidence. The basis for his confidence is Christ's victory and the privilege of sharing in his glory. To share in his glory, to the fullest extent, you have to be willing to share in his sufferings. We're not above him. The servant is not greater than his master. And since Christ suffered, these different things, I'm not talking about the suffering uh, for sins, I'm talking about the sufferings uh, that people imposed upon him through his public ministry and especially towards the very end of it, when uh, they manipulated things to get him crucified, the Jews, <clears throat> to encourage these believers, the writer develops a series of interwoven strands of thought. The idea that a person, righteous person can face suffering with confidence, the basis for this confidence is Christ's victory and the privilege of sharing in his glory. The section opens with a rhetorical question. The thrust of the question is this, if God is on the side of the adjusted and against those who practice evil, what harm can possible, what ultimate harm can possibly come to those who do good? The outcome will be good. Yes, we will suffer various indignities, various things as a result of persecution. The harm picks up on the cognate evil in the verse above. The opening and is best rendered then, now, besides. The gist of the transition between the quotation in verses 10 through 12 and 13 is, in light of what has just been said, or under the circumstances, the phrase zealous for what is good, literally zealous of good, is to be compared with Titus 2, 14. We are, to, we are to be zealous for good deeds. Acts 21, 20, we're zealous for the law. 22, 3, Galatians 1, 14. The sentiment expressed here can be found across a wide spectrum of biblical literature. <clears throat> Dealing with suffering, adversity by the believer. <clears throat> all those verses in the Old and New Testament. A pagan parallel is Socrates' remark to his judges. No harm can befall a good man, either when he is alive or when he is dead, and the gods do not neglect his cause. Because this is coming from a pagan. But you see that he, is, he has some truth in it that no harm can befall a good man. Peter is, of course, using harm in a specialized sense. He is not deluding his readers with the idea that if their conduct is in line with Scripture, they will escape abuse, maltreatment, physical injury, or anything you might want to name. His point is that whatever disasters strike the adjusted cannot overturn their vital interests. Temporal interests can be overturned on, on, for people and are all the time. But they don't have, they aren't, they aren't adjusted to God and his plan to take something bad and God works it for good. Every time. You may not see it immediately. You may not recognize it immediately. Perhaps you've had experiences where you went through something and it, was, it wasn't pleasant and everything, but then down the road things changed and you saw that worked, that worked, for, that, that worked out for the good. That's just a human illustration. It always works out for the good for those who are in with it in God's plan. <clears throat> 15, his point is that whatever disasters strike the adjusted cannot overturn their vital interests. This includes principally, first, their eternal salvation. They can't, they can't take that away from you. Nothing can take that away from you. Nothing. And he gives a whole list of possible situations and, and, and includes, or any other creature, which means it created or developed thing, which would include, you can't, you could renounce Christ, and there's those that have, after they believed. 
God isn't petty. He isn't going to make them unsaved. The, the plan doesn't work that way. You step in it, you're in it. For good or for bad for you. Whatever you do with it. If you follow up on it, like some of you have, and stick with it, then you will, to use another expression for SG3, reap eternal life. Like we do, people reap what they sow. Uh, good or bad. An agricultural term. So, you're going to reap eternal life by staying in fellowship and applying Bible doctrine. And here on our context, when the sufferings are from the source of others. This includes their eternal salvation or their SG3 account. Once you lay up a treasure in heaven, it's there. It is going to be jerked back away from you. You can't, you, what, SG3 gained, that, that's, you know, that's money in the bank, so to speak. Not that it's safe there. <laughs> Just an illustration. It's an expression. That's money in the bank. It's yours. Nothing you can do will cause you to forfeit the good applications you've made in your life and you build up SG3. Hopefully, hopefully you're doing it every day. You've got every opportunity. You go to school. You go to work. You go to uh, whatever it is. <clears throat> you're suffering some, something physically. You're reaping eternal life to the extent that you're in fellowship. So, or their SG3 account, where Jesus said, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where nothing can lay their hands on it. No thief, you can't mess it up. People, people are messing up wealth all over the place. Uh, they get some big fat inheritance and they just blow it. Because they didn't have anything before much, so now they're just gonna go like, it's like they're on a, they're on a, on a drinking spree. And then they wake up and they blew tens of millions of dollars because they got they won a they won a lottery or something. You win the lottery, you'll get a lot of new friends. Just kidding. <laughs> you don't want them. <laughs> uh, and also first Peter 1, 4 through 6. To come to this happy state, believers must prove zealous for what is good. The verb prove is an aorist subjunctive indicating that it is a potential and therefore up to the self-discipline of the individual positive believer. The good refers to the conduct Peter calls these believers to under the general heading of, heading of do not render evil for evil. In verse 14, Peter reinforces that assurance. The question who then is going to harm you? Implies as its answer, since it's rhetorical, no one. No one. God preserves our vital interests. Building on the answer, the but even, of verse 14 introduces a beatitude. What is more, even if you should suffer, you're blessed. I'm suffering. I'm being blessed. Doesn't sound like the two go together, does it? But they do for the positive believer adjusted to the plan of God. The safety from harm mentioned in verse 13 corresponds to the blessedness of verse 14. And therefore, by no means rules out the possibility of suffering for the sake of righteousness. The translation, no, even if you should have to suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, probably represents an adaptation of the eighth, uh, the eighth beatitude of Matthew 5. That's the Sermon on the Mount thing, event, in, in which we have what they call beatitudes. 
and you're blessed if these things occur in your life. <clears throat> when he had... Uh, He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, that doesn't mean some downcast, woe is me. It doesn't mean that. Poor in spirit, this would, this would not be a virtue in some cultures. This, this is another way of somebody who is not relying on their self. They're poor in spirit. They know where the source of all this is. They, knew, they know who they are. are they, that, that they're not proud or arrogant or taking credit, they ultimately give the glory and credit to God. That's poor in spirit. Whereas other people, they're, they were lucky or they're smart or whatever it was. Uh, we are poor in spirit. We know who we are and who we depend on. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It, it, see, it starts with poor in spirit. You heard, you heard the gospel and you humbled yourself. You knew you needed this and that you were in a bad way and you weren't arrogant about it. You didn't blow it off. Oh, I'm, I do a lot of good. That, that's not in, that, that isn't going to get you salvation. Phase one, you do a lot of good. Yeah, there's all kinds of people out here, believe it or not, that do a lot of good. But it isn't going to get them salvation. And sometimes, it, and sometimes they do it for, for reasons of pride and approbation. But it, whatever their motivations are, uh, it's the person that is willing to humble themselves and believe in Jesus Christ. That's the start of poor in spirit. I have nothing to offer. I can't save myself. This is the way. That's, and, then, and, that, and then throw on your Christian life. Blessed are those who mourn. There's nothing wrong with mourning for various reasons. Not just the death of a loved one, but seeing people go down spiritually where they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle. Well, they'll inherit the earth. See, these are all phase three things. The gentle, kind and gentle. We had that for the Sarah's daughter thing. Gentle. You're not, you know, you know how to approach situations with a gentle touch where appropriate. Always, I add. <clears throat> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be satisfied. I think that refers to phase three. We're looking for righteousness on this earth. <clears throat> and we'll get a very high level of it in the millennium. But even in the millennium with these people that are negative and Sid natures, we're looking for the ultimate high. And that's the new earth in which perfect righteousness dwells in every living person. And we don't have to talk about any of this stuff that is just off the charts today. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they'll receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. What's pure in heart mean? You mean you're sinless? No, that's not possible. Pure in heart is, here's what I get from it. They're intellectually honest and they're teachable. They will bury their own ideas if they don't match up with scripture, their own belief, they're humble. And that's, you don't find this. this. This component that goes with positive volition. That they're willing to humble themselves. And uh, <clears throat> the pure in heart. Well, they shall see God. That's, that's the afterlife. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the sons of God. Anytime you can be a peacemaker between two people. There's examples in the Bible that someone was a go-between and got these two people that were, that, that were at each other's throats. And you guys got, got them to sit down and reason it out and come to, and, and, and they made peace with each other rather than treating 
the thing that got him odds like it was the end of the world. It isn't. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake, this is for our part, for the sake of righteousness. Now, there's all kinds of people being persecuted for a variety of reasons. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you. We, we, we wouldn't think like that, would we? Apart from Bible doctrine. We wouldn't have that high ground of thinking. The world in general doesn't think you're being blessed when you're being insulted. <clears throat> A verbal attack. <clears throat> and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, whether it's to your face or behind your back. And Christians that do that to others, you're on the line. All these stupid stuff on, on, on the internet, they have their little corner where they get together and attack somebody. You got nothing better to do? You stoop to that level? I wouldn't get on the internet and point out all the, all the false churches and individuals out there. One, I don't have the time for it. Two, it's not profitable. I will point out that they, I will point out things that are false that they're thinking and doing because I have to expose evil. So you, so you, you can just brush that off when you come across it. You can see through it. You can't straighten them out. They're not, they're, they're not teachable. They're locked in to their, the air of their way. And I'll just refer to a lot of Christians, a lot of them. <clears throat> look, at the, look the way they're starting to compromise now. I might have told you, but I saw that in the United Methodist, I saw this black minister from Africa get up there because he was one of the ones that voted against this, allowing gay people to be ministers and gay marriages and all this. He said, you just threw out the authority of Scripture. You just took all those verses and everything that teaches against this, and you just threw it out. This is a God's word. That was good. No American stood up for it in that organization that I know of. There may be, but he did. Rebuked all of them. He said, I don't know what we're going to do with regard to our denominational future. <clears throat> Would you want to be a part of an organization that says it's all right to have a gay pastor? No, not in a million years. I mean, for years they had, they had women ministers. The Bible's against it. Paul would not suffer a woman to teach men. They're great at teaching kiddos. They can witness one-on-one. -on -one. Fine. But they don't like that in, in our world today. They won't adjust to the roles that the different genders play and historically and so forth. <clears throat> they think it's degrading. It isn't. It's godly. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. Remember that one. <clears throat> this isn't dealing with, it, with the crown. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is dealing with some other big SG3. And some of us Christians through, through, the, through, through the dispensation, we've taken a lot of verbal attacks. And those who took it right, their reward is waiting for them when they get their resurrection bodies is great. And when God says something's great, you know, a lot of people say, oh, this is great. And you go there, oh, the restaurant was okay. I've had better and I've had worse. But they're, well, maybe it is great to them. I don't know. But it didn't commend it to you. But when God says something's great, 
It's going to be great. Do you think you'll be excited about it like you are down here if something uh, of that sort happens to you? You think you'll come up running up to me and say, Jack, look what I got for that. <laughs> I don't know how we'll act. <laughs> because I can't comprehend it either, but I just go by faith. If God says it's great, it's great by all standards. It's also great because you can't lose it. You can't die and be separated from it. You can't have someone take it from you. You can't even give it away. It's yours. It's your glory on top of glory with a perfect resurrection body and what these things are since I've taught. There's technically nothing you in the strict sense need. It doesn't matter. He says, for in the same fashion, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do you think these prophets had an easy road? The Jewish prophets, the age of Israel? Oh, this is a prophet. They got a lot of hell. You can read about them from their own people. A prophet of God when they were in reversionism. So criticizing the Jews or an individual, Jew or Gentile, but criticizing a Jew, criticizing, uh, pointing out something they've done that's evil, that isn't anti-Semitic. That's not anti-Semitism. Paul has some very hard statements to make about his own race. On the other hand, he felt bad for him. He didn't like seeing them like that. But he didn't pull any punches. Because with their religion and the way it was at the first advent, they're, they're, they're the blind leading the blind. They're all going to fall in the ditch, hell. And the prophets in Old Testament times took a lot of abuse from Jews. Read, read Jeremiah and some of the runs he's has, had with them. Some prophets were, were beaten and some were even <coughs> martyred because they went out and spoke a message that God told them to speak to the general population where they could get an audience. <clears throat> and it was all for the good to call them back to God. There were examples where the Jews did respond. <clears throat> and then he goes on, you're the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. It's a preservative. One. You're the salt of the earth. They used to, before refrigeration and everything, they'd salt meat down. So it would preserve it. You had different applications for it. You're the salt of the earth. Well, there's, a, there's so few of us now that are acting like salt. Even, even, the, even the main stream denomination, they've lost a bunch of their standards. And the Christians are not being the salt of the earth. And so this leaven, this is running amok in this country. Look at Harvard. Do you know why that's, that Ivy League elite school was founded in the beginning of its charter? One of the things in its charter was to train men to teach and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't think that's within a hundred miles of that place now. So all that's gone by the wayside. And Christians have bought into all these, a lot, now when I use the word Christians, there is nominal Christians that are not believers under the banner Christian. And then there are Christians that are indeed Christians and they're scattered all over the place. You go to this church because your mom did, okay. What was I going to say? Oh, that uh, they, they've, they've lost their salt. When, when, when they're embracing all this perverted stuff, gender confusion, all of it, they've compromised. Well, I don't, I, somebody told me, someone said, 
I don't want to judge anybody. Really? You make judgments every day. If a guy, if a person is a child molester, I judge that as really bad. And he ought to be strung up after a fair trial. That's what he ought to be. But now we have child abuse everywhere by teaching him this junk. They're telling me how bad it is in a lot of the public schools now. Kids are being dismissed right and left. They don't, they're not, parents aren't training them, aren't backing up the teachers, and all this stuff's going on. The country's coming apart in every which way. Every which way. I mean, okay, I'm not saying it was great in the 70s. I was looking at some of the things that went on in the 70s. Okay, but, the, but that was a pathway heading towards this. <clears throat> this is what we're, we're seeing. We're seeing in the tail end, the dead end of America. And before it's overthrown physically, it's overthrown morally. And the very few of us that are the salt of the earth, we're the ones that will stand up and say, according to the word of God, that activity is evil. Now you want to go up against it and call evil, call, call evil good and vice versa? That's what's all around us. And those who aren't in favor of it say, well, okay. Okay, so this one believer said, some others, uh, some people out there in his neighborhood invited him to uh, a meal, an evening meal. Well, the woman has a, a, has a couple female friends that are lesbians. And I said, I wouldn't go near it. Because by being there, you're telling them this is a okay. See, so you, you figure it out for yourself. But it's all over the place. Everywhere. And even Christians have become the salt is no longer salt. I did like the, uh, uh, some official in the Oklahoma school system, I don't know who he is. He said, uh, what, what did he say? He said, the, first, the second part of it I got, he said, uh, well, he said, as for the, we don't want the Satanists in our school. He said, they can assemble in hell. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get the first part of it, but it, it, was, it was pretty good. See, we, need, we, 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 we ought to have people in high places that speak out against us. Oh, oh they, will be, they will be vilified to the high heaven. Every pundit and idiot will be out, out there screaming and yelling at them. But they're in the right. We're isolated here in this church, and maybe somebody listens to it on here. And probably most of us, don't, no one comes up and says, what do you think of? <clears throat> I'll tell you what the Bible says, and I'm a Bible believer, and I, I have good reasons to believe this is the word of God, and I got, I, got, I got all kinds of proofs that what this said in here, I, I, I can take you and show you that all these places, names, uh, sites, locations, countries, people, events, rulers, they all existed. This isn't made up. Some of them even obscure names. And then they find them, and archaeology helps us out when, I, when they do it right. They find stuff that points right to the integrity of the Bible. So that's why I believe the Bible is the Word of God. And, and uh, you know, take, take a big one. Take that all over our bulletin board. The true Red Sea crossing site. Not the fake one. Like when I was in Israel, my guide, who was Arab, he said, do you want to see the fake Christian sites or the real ones? I said, both. I'm just curious.
Uh, anyway, all right. Where are we at here? Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so to get to this place, this happy place, you have to prove zealous for what is good. <clears throat> the verb prove, point 18, is an aorist subjunctive indicated that is potential and therefore up to the self-discipline of the individual. The good refers to the conduct Peter calls his believers to under the general heading of do not render evil for evil. In verse 14, Peter reinforces the insurance, assurance. 21, the question, who then is going to harm you implies no one building on this answer, but introduces a beatitude. What is more, even if you should suffer, you're blessed. The safety from harm mentioned in verse 13 corresponds to blessedness in verse 14, and therefore by no means rules out the possibility of suffering. The translation, no, even if you should have to suffer for the cause of righteousness, you're blessed, probably represents an adaptation of that beatitude. You are blessed, when we read. The verb should suffer, point 26, I'm skipping down, is an aorist optative that has generated speculation with respect to the recipient's situation vis-a-vis -vis suffering. It is clear from Peter's statement in 4.12 that they were really suffering persecution rather than suffering being a remote possibility. That such trials were more than a remote possibility can be seen in the letter. As per 1, 6, and 7, 2, 18 through 20, as to, well as what follows in the book. The optative mode denotes remote possibility and is rare in the New Testament. About one-fourth of the optives occur in a set formula, meganoito. In the New Testament, the optative is becoming absorbed by the subjunctive in the Koine period. Not that you need to know that. Here and in verse 17, we have a conditional optative. It is used of a remote possibility in the future. Acts 20, 16 provides another example. For he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Other classifications of the optative include, this is all technical stuff, the potential optative, it appears with the particle, uh, as seen in Acts 17, 18. Some were saying, what would this babbler say? The implicit protasis is, if he could say anything meaningful. The oblique narrative is used in uh, an indirect question, as in Luke 1, 121. She was pondering, she was pondering what sort of greeting this might be. Uh, and so forth. Uh, how are we to guard this, one, this conditional one? These believers were not continuously and universally undergoing persecution. They lived in an environment charged with suspicion. Hostility had erupted in the lives of some and was liable to erupt at any time in painful incidents. This risk always imminent, but for the most part, a threat rather than an actuality is itself sufficient to explain the optative. But a further reason for the presence of the opti may be detected in the logic of Peter's line of thinking. This verse is closely tied to the preceding one where he has in effect declared, no one can possibly hurt where it matters if you are devoted to doing good. Now, reinforcing his statement, he says, nevertheless, if your devotion to righteousness should land you in trouble, you should count it a privilege. The phrase, suffer for the sake of righteousness, refers to undeserved suffering from the source of people brought on by your adherence, your strict adherence to the truth of Bible doctrine. <clears throat> to be blessed is to gain divine approbation and to qualify for eternal rewards. Still further, to brace his readers' morale, he inserts apropos words from Isaiah 18, 12. 8, 12. In the context of 8, 12, the prophet and his followers are not to share the to share the fear of the populace fear not their fear the king of assyria or count holy what they count holy but rather regard the lord of the armies as holy and fear him alone in the septuagint of acts 8:12 c has the genitive singular his fear referring to the king of assyria or peter substitutes their fear referring to their persecutors the there of Peter refers to the enemy. 
Peter's use of cognate accusative, to fear a fear, indicates that the Isaiah text is his primary point of departure. Peter follows the, the Greek version rather than the Hebrew text. The final phrase is literally, neither be terrified or troubled. As we recall Jesus' words in John 14, 1 or 14, 27, B. He's, he's telling his followers, do not be afraid. But they owe their form to Isaiah 8, 12, C. Fear in, induces us to compromise and thus in, deny Christ. That's what happened to Peter when he was confronted by the little servant girl while Christ was inside. Fear. A woman, a young woman, intimidated him. Not because she's going to threaten him with anything. You're one of his followers, aren't you? No, you're mistaken. He did it three times. See what fear does? It gets you in this defensive mode. God will give you the wisdom in the face of adversity and how to handle people if you have to. You may not. You may go on and nobody is after you because you go to this church or take in doctrine. You never know. Remember, when we suffer persecution, again, in conclusion, the enemy cannot overturn our vital interests. They can't touch it. And we earn the approbation of God who is with us through it all. See you Tuesday night, God willing. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us in Christ's name. Amen.